Hey everyone, and welcome to the Boost Your Biology podcast. My name is Lucas, and I am the founder of Ergogenic Health. Together in this podcast series, we will go underground to explore cutting edge health and human performance insights that you simply cannot search on Google to help you upgrade your existence. So without any further ado, let's jump into today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Boost Your Biology podcast. I'm super excited for today's guest, who's a chiropractor and functional medicine practitioner who attained both his doctorate of chiropractic and master's in human nutrition and functional medicine from the University of Western States in Portland, Oregon. Dr. Stephen Hussey, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. So, Stephen, maybe you want to let my listeners know a little bit about your journey and let them know how you got so fascinated into, I guess, optimizing human health. Yeah. I mean, like a lot of people in my space, it started with my own health journey and I was kind of driven to it. I had really no choice, but yeah, when I was a kid, I had a lot of inflammatory conditions, everything from asthma to allergies to IBS, like irritable bowel syndrome. I used to break out in hives all over my body and the doctors really couldn't tell me why they just feed me prednisone and stuff. But yeah, I had all these inflammatory conditions that ultimately ended up with autoimmune inflammatory type one diabetes. I got diagnosed when I was nine, where my body kind of attacked the cells that make insulin. So I no longer make insulin, which is different than type two diabetes, which is where your body still makes insulin, but you're resistant to it. You're not responding to it very well. You become insulin resistant. And so, you know, when I was diagnosed with that and with all those inflammatory conditions, my parents and I kind of, you know, relied on Western medicine to figure things out and try to manage these conditions. But key word was manage. You know, and there was no explanation of why it happened or how you could, you know, prevent them or, or get rid of them or anything like that. And so it wasn't until college when I started getting interested in health that I realized that the way I lived my life had a direct impact on my ability to manage these conditions. And now, you know, through all a lot of trial and error over the years, all those conditions are gone aside from the type one diabetes, which is kind of collateral damage from that inflammation I had as a kid. But yeah, I found it curious that no doctor ever really told me you know, that the way you live your life, you could change things and you wouldn't have these inflammatory conditions or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of, you know, spurred my journey to go, cause I was, I wanted to be like a physician of some sort, but that kind of, you know, influenced my journey more toward like holistic health, I guess. And so I, I'd seen chiropractic with my life. So I decided to go to chiropractic school after college and, um, and then my master's in human nutrition and everything like that. So, but yeah, so since I'm type one diabetic, I'm heavily predisposed to heart disease. And so from a very early on, when I started you know, learning about health, I always perked, my ears always perked up whenever I heard about heart disease. And I just soaked in as much as I could anywhere that I could, no real filter, just anything about heart health, no matter how off the wall it seemed to be at the time, I was just always wanting to read it. And yeah, so I guess maybe four or five years ago, I started sharing a lot of the information that I had attained about the heart and heart health and just health in general. And uh, I started sharing on social media and people seemed to like it and you know, so I wrote uh, a few books, one of them all about the heart and what I found about the heart. A lot of surprising things that I found very contrary to what, you know, I was taught in school and what uh, most people are taught about the heart. But yeah, I wrote down a book and, and that came out last April. And now here I am talking about all this stuff on podcasts and social media and stuff. Yeah. It's incredible just to hear your journey, Stephen, as far as like your own personal struggles. And what I'd love to learn more about is actually a bit about some of the interventions that you found were highly effective as far as improving your own well-being and vitality? Yeah. So for me, like diet's been something that's always been easy for me because it's like I could pick a way to eat and I could stick to it. You know, I was pretty strict about that. Other things were more difficult, but that's always something I had control over because there's lots of different strategies that no matter how hard you try, you'll never have full control over how many toxins you're exposed to or or whatever, you know, but diet, you can directly control that if you have the willpower to do so. Right. So um, that was always a huge lever for me. That was the first thing that I noticed that especially with type one diabetes, the way I ate had a direct impact on my ability to manage blood sugars because I'm trying to be a pancreas. I'm trying to keep my blood sugar stable without, you know, a functioning, you know, beta cells of the pancreas. But yeah, so that was the first big lever I found out, but exercise was another big one. You know, because at first for me, it was just like, I always enjoyed being active because it was fun. I'd play sports and things like that. I never really thought about the health benefits. It's just, let's do this. It's fun. But then, you know, I came to learn that, you know, how active it was also had a direct impact on my ability to manage blood sugars, which is kind of the end all be all for type one diabetes. We're trying to keep stable blood sugars. 
But, you know, I would go deeper and deeper and deeper and, and learn about all the toxin exposures and all the different strategies that you can implement to avoid toxins and how, you know, just everyday life, you're exposed to many, many toxins in the world. And it's hard to avoid them all. It's impossible to avoid them all, but doing your due diligence to avoid a lot of them is really important. Everything from heavy metals to plastics to, you know, artificial fragrances, things like that. Mm. But then at one point I really got into like the, I call it like the biophysics of the body. Some people call it quantum biology, where you're looking at, you know, the physics of the body. Like it's not just a biochemical thing. It's not just nutrition and pharmaceuticals and biochemistry. It's biophysics as well. And putting your body in the right environment to do so. So that's concerning light. It's concerning electromagnetic fields to make sure the right ones. It's concerning stress. It's concerning water, different things like that. And so, so that became a big aspect of what I do to attain health is put myself in the right environments and minimize the wrong ones, minimize the toxic light or the filtered light or minimize the wrong electromagnetic fields and things like that. So, so yeah, it, it's kind of like this stepwise process. I just kept adding things to it. And, and, you know, it's not like, you know, I say I kept adding things to it, but really it's just as much about adding things to do as it is about taking away the things that you don't want to do, right? You can't just keep adding and adding and adding and keep doing the behaviors and things that are causing the disease. I liken that to like, you know, firefighters continually putting out fires without catching the arsonist and just keep setting the fires. You know, let's catch the arsonist so we don't have to spit out those fires. But yeah, that's kind of a, you know, I guess some bullet points of, of what I do. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to learn more about like what you uncovered as far as like from cardiovascular disease, Maybe shall we start with, I guess, the one that's kind of debated the most, and that is the correlation between cholesterol intake and cardiovascular disease. Like, what do we know now? Yeah, so I mean, it's a huge topic. It's obviously heavily debated, even though based on what I see, I don't really think there's too much debate. The debate comes from, you know, maybe vested interests in a theory that cholesterol causes heart disease. And so we have people who, you know, will stand by that theory because, they have money to gain from it, or they're being paid by someone who has money to gain from it or something like that. Well, first of all, people should know that, you know, humans have been eating cholesterol for, you know, millions of years. I mean, humans, modern humans have only been around for about 300,000 years, but even our, you know, previous ancestors were eating animal foods full of cholesterol before that. And in the early 1900s, the field of cardiology wasn't even really a field. It was like, you know, there was a few medical doctors or scientists that were interested in the heart and stuff like that. And they studied it, but this whole, you know, cardiology specialty wasn't even really a thing. There wasn't this, you know, college of cardiology and stuff like that because it just wasn't a big deal. So heart disease is a very new thing, you know? So how could a very new disease, a very modern disease be so correlated or be so caused by this molecule that's been around for millions of years, right? It doesn't make sense at all. And just from a philosophical standpoint, but the whole idea that cholesterol caused heart disease came from in the 40s and 50s, you know, heart disease was rising and the at least the American population was freaking out about it. And President Eisenhower had a heart attack very famously while he was in office. And so people were worried about this new disease that was skyrocketing and they wanted an answer. And the scientist from University of Minnesota called named Ansel Keys gave people that answer. And that answer was that cholesterol and saturated fat in the diet is what caused heart disease. And he made this conclusion based on some very flawed research called epidemiology, which is only observational research. You can't show that something causes one another or something causes something else. All you can show is that they're happening at the same time. And so, you know, and later scientists repeated his work and they found there was no correlation because he cherry picked the data. He found, you know, the data that would give him the correlation that he wanted. So it was, it was very flawed and people suspect he had, you know, backing from the industries like the sugar industry and the grain industry that and the cereal industry that wanted, wanted that theory that saturated fat was bad for you to take off. And it's actually a very heavily tested theory. They actually did a lot of, you know, randomized controlled trials testing that theory where they removed saturated fat in people's diet and put unsaturated fat in their diet, thinking it would make them healthier. However, most of those, all those studies, pretty much, there was like four or five different ones done in the 1950s and 60s showed that the more unsaturated fat that people ate in the form of margarine or vegetable oils or whatever, the more heart disease they had, the more all-cause mortality they had. And lots of these studies were kind of, you know, unpublished for a while, or they were published kind of under the rug. You know, you didn't really see it. They weren't put out in the open. There was no headlines about it because the theory that cholesterol caused heart disease had already taken off. Right. Yeah. And so there was a lot of money behind that as well. So they wanted to keep that going or, you know, industry wanted to keep that going. But if we look at the actual like evidence for it, there's, you know, when we look at what atherosclerosis is, you know, hardening of the artery, if we look at what atherosclerosis is made up of, it's not cholesterol. 
it's made up of clotting material. And there's some lipoprotein, cholesterol, you know, containing molecules in atherosclerosis because when clots happen, you know, whatever happens to be around gets absorbed into that clot. And there's evidence that, you know, some lipoproteins like LP little A play a role in preventing the body from breaking down that clot. So they show up at the scene, things like that. But the vast majority, anywhere from, you know, 85, 95% of atherosclerotic material is, is fibrotic material. It's clotting tissue. So it's what happens when the body chooses to clot, just like if you cut your finger and your body clots to form a scab to prevent that from bleeding. The same thing happens when damage occurs to the lining of the artery a clot forms. It's not this, you have high cholesterol in your blood and it slowly builds up over time because it gets stuck on the line. That's not what happens. It's just, there's no science to really show that. And so then we have to ask ourselves, you know, what are the things that cause to damage the lining of the artery that cause it to clot? And those are the things we should be concerned about when it comes to atherosclerosis, not this high cholesterol number and things like that. Brilliantly summarized. I think that's given my audience a great insight into some of the Flawed research that was pioneered by Hansel Keys. What I'd love to also explore with you, Stephen, is I guess in relation to some of the nutritional interventions that you've seen have some form of you know solid evidence to actually, I guess, improve parameters associated with atherosclerosis. And what sort of data do we have there? Yeah. So atherosclerosis happens for two different reasons. There's two different imbalances, I guess, that happen in the body that cause it to happen. So one is we get damage to the lining of the artery and that damage can be caused by a lot of different things. It can be caused by a poor diet that leads to inflammation, you know, vegetable oils and grains and sugars and things like that. Very inflammatory foods. It can be toxins that we're exposed to. It could be endotoxins that come from leaky gut or poor dental health. Lots of different things that have been shown to cause damage, heavy metals, things like that have been shown to cause damage to the lining of the artery. But when that damage happens, there's a certain amount of damage that's considered like normal wear and tear, you know, it's supposed to happen. And the lining of the arteries are very good at repairing themselves as long as the mechanisms of repair are intact. And one of those key mechanisms of repair is insulin signaling because insulin is this hormone that signals for growth and repair. And so that's why we see such a heavy correlation between type two diabetes and cardiovascular disease is because these people are insulin resistant. So when they get that damage to the lining of the artery from all these different things, one of them can be high blood sugars that can cause this damage, which is why type ones are associated or predisposed to it. But when we get these things that damage the lining of the artery and the artery can't repair itself in a timely fashion, either because there's too much burden of damage or because there's no insulin signaling to help repair that damage, then the body has to do something because that damage is going to eventually wind up as a rupture of an artery or bleeding, you know, bleeding out. It's kind of eroded away. And so the body does the only thing it knows how to do, which is initiate clotting to kind of patch that up, kind of like spackle, you know, on drywall. So that's kind of where it comes from. And those are the mechanisms that, you know, contribute to atherosclerosis, which is one type of cardiovascular disease. It's the disease of the arteries. Again, it's the inflammation and oxidative stress causing damage combined with the insulin resistance that, you know, triggers that clotting and that then clots can form on top of each other and that can build up and cause this narrowing of the artery. So I guess with that form of cardiovascular disease, like atherosclerosis, I'd imagine that's a progressive thing that, you know, maybe is it after a certain age, we see, you know, a rise in in risk associated with that? I mean, you can, I mean, definitely with age, just because people have been going through those things that cause damage for a longer amount of time, you know, yeah. they've been eating a poor diet for a longer amount of time. They've been exposed to more toxins. As we grow up, we tend to have more stress because more responsibilities, things like that. And stress is definitely a trigger of those, but yeah, like nutritionally, you know, what to do about that is eat a diet that creates metabolic health, eat a diet that, you know, wards off insulin resistance, keeps you metabolically healthy so that when that damage does occur, that your body has mechanisms in place that are functioning optimally that repair that damage. So it has insulin signaling. And so that's, to me, generally a whole foods diet will do that. And I think an emphasis on animal foods is the way to go because that's going to give you the most bang for your buck. The best way to get adequate nutrition while also creating metabolic health is a diet higher in animal foods. There was a tiny little bit of fear that I was wondering, uh, I was like, oh, is Stephen plant-based? Is Stephen vegan? (laughs) But thankfully, thankfully not. But I guess like what I'd love to learn more about is like your own experimentation. I'd imagine you've been tracking your blood sugar, probably using a CGM device, or maybe do you want to share with my listeners, like, have you seen certain foods like spike your blood sugar super high that 
may not have, you know, surprisingly. Not necessarily unsurprisingly, because, you know, I studied nutrition, so I kind of knew like, you know, which foods would do it, but it's really different for everybody. Like lots of type ones I've talked to, they'll have random foods that seem to spike it more than other people's. And the other thing is it's going to change over time. You know, like what I am doing right now, what works for me right now may not work for me 10 years from now. And that's going to change. I mean, like I remember when I was first diagnosed with diabetes, I was still making a little insulin so I could get away with things. And also I was, I was a kid, so I would tend to try and get away with things. Um, I didn't quite understand the long-term implications and things like that, but but yeah, so like what's worked for me has changed over the years. However, you mentioned like plant-based and I did try a vegan diet once like almost over 12 years ago now. And I found blood sugar is quite hard to control. And there are, there are vegans out there who are type one vegans who say that it's really easy to control. So it's like, who am I to say, okay, that that's anything, you know, or that, that they're wrong or something. I don't necessarily agree with that diet any longer, but yeah, so it's, it's really, it varies between people. But one thing I found interesting to me is that and lots of type one diabetics don't know this is that as a type one diabetic, you're also predisposed to something called gastroparesis, which is basically delayed stomach emptying. So you eat something I find, especially animal protein and it delays stomach emptying because it's, it's that slower release of the food and digests it a bit, releases it from the stomach a bit slower and a type one diabetic. And I think that has a lot to do with imbalance in the autonomic nervous system and delayed signaling to the parasympathetic the stimulus digestion and things like that. But that's something you have to be careful with because I found and me personally that, you know, I eat my animal based diet. And if I gave all the insulin, I think I needed for that meal, even if there's no carbohydrate in it, you know, I still give a little insulin for protein. If I gave it all right after the meal, my blood sugar is going to go low because the food's going to be processed later on. And so I've kind of have to time it out a bit differently doing that because you know, as a kid, I was taught, I had to figure all this out by myself because as a kid, doctors taught me, oh yeah, you only take the carbohydrates and you only give insulin for the carbohydrates. You know, so then, you know, when I first go to animal base, you know, years ago, you know, blood sugar would go up, but slowly over time. And I'm just like, what's going on? I didn't have any carbohydrates. Like, and I had to figure out for myself that it was the slow digestion of protein that was going on. And then for me, it was even slower because of the gastroparesis um, that I feel I have a little bit of, not severely, but I do. So yeah, just different things to think about there. But, you know, people should know protein will raise your blood sugar if you're type 1 diabetic, you know. If you're not type 1 diabetic and you have normal insulin signaling and you're not type 2 diabetic, then protein is probably one of the best blood sugar stabilizing foods out there, but animal protein. But it can be a little tricky with uh, with the type 1. Let's explore some of the symptoms associated with low blood sugar states versus high blood sugar states. And maybe um, I'd imagine it may differ for type one diabetics versus the everyday person, but like for you, what are the telltale signs you're hypoglycemic or on the contrary, what are the symptoms signs if you're high blood sugar or hyperglycemia? Yeah, this is different for everybody. I've talked to a lot of type one diabetics. Some of them don't even feel a low blood sugar and they just pass out right in front of you. You know, they just didn't, they never felt it. And it got so low that they just they pass out. I've heard of that. I've never seen that, but I've heard about people like that. For me, I've always been able to tell always, like if it drops just a little bit low, I, I can feel it. And to me, it's like, I just feel kind of weak, kind of lightheaded. And you know, sometimes I break out in a cold sweat. And yeah, I, I mostly feel that my legs, but yeah, and people think, oh, it's because your blood sugar is low. You don't have glucose going into your cells. That's why you're feeling that way. But that's not really the case. The case is, is that your blood sugar is low and your body is having an adrenaline response to mobilize glucose to get that back into the bloodstream so that it comes back up. But yeah, I've heard a lot of different symptoms of that, but those are the main ones for me. And then as far as high blood sugar, that's harder to detect, but I've always been able to feel it pretty well. When my blood sugar gets to 200 or more, I'm starting to feel it. Where I've heard people who get to 400, they don't feel it at all. So yeah, the world of type 1 diabetics is a bit different than the normal. It's like most people hear 200, it's like, oh my gosh, 200 blood sugar. You know, but I'll definitely feel it if it gets up that high. And to me, it just feels like, I don't know, something just feels off. I, I can't even really say it. Like maybe a little bit like of a dry mouth. And then like, it almost feels like my muscles are going to cramp in a minute or something. They're not going to but they feel like they're going to or something like that. And that's kind of how I can tell. So yeah, that's what I kind of look for, but it's different for everybody. It's interesting because I actually ran some experiments on myself, Stephen. I got myself a CGM device. I love running different experiments. I ended up trialing pure cane sugar, just pure cane sugar water or juice, cane sugar juice. Mm -hmm. 
and I saw like a massive, it hit like 183, I think, went straight back up, but then it literally came straight back down right exactly from where it was previous to when I took the drink or drank the actual juice. What I noticed when it did hit that peak was I found that my cognition was fading a little bit. Like I felt mm. a bit more like sloppy, mm. um, maybe not as sharp and witty. Um, but then interestingly, I didn't really notice like a crash, like a typical crash feeling probably because it didn't go too far down low where it was um, at baseline. But yeah, I think it's really interesting for people to try and pay more attention to like basically how certain foods affect various parameters of performance and health, you know? Yeah. Cause you know, if like, say you have a CGM and you, and you do that experiment like you did and it goes up and it comes right back down, like that's normal physiology. That's what's supposed to happen. However, if you do that day in and day out over and over and over again for a long time, you're going to wear out that physiology and that can cause issues that can cause damage, you know, lots of damage, you know, cause it's the it, research has shown that it's, it's the oscillation of blood sugar, the ups and downs that cause damage to the lining of the artery more so than having higher blood sugar that's stable. So it's the ups and downs yeah. that, that do it. So, um, so yeah, eating like that, even if you're in a, a non-diabetic, just that experiment you did shows that it goes way up and it comes back down pretty regularly or pretty fast. And, um, and that causes more damage, it seems. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because like what you're mentioning there is like, it's the fluctuations and the blood sugar variability that's mm. dangerous and damaging. Whereas heart rate variability is a good thing. Have you seen mm. much, you know, association with like heart rate variability and cardiovascular health? Yeah. And so kind of to clarify, I like to define health, I think, as the ability of the body to adapt to different situations. So like if you have that high glucose drink you were talking about and your blood sugar goes way up, but your body responds and brings it way back down and it goes right back to level, that's health. That's what health is. You know, you, you can adapt to that stimulus. Doing that over and over again may may provide an imbalance long, or create an imbalance long-term, right? When we go to heart rate variability, that's exactly what it's measuring in the stress response of our, of our, of our nervous system. So, you know, our autonomic nervous system is a system in our body that's measuring our environment or monitoring our environment through our senses and then telling your body if this is a safe or threatening environment. Based on which one it is, you'll have the appropriate response. You know, get away from that threat, fight it off, flee it, whatever. Or you're in a safe space and you can sleep and digest and procreate and whatever you want to do, you know, like those types of things. And so, again, normal physiology is that if we had a stress, something jumped out from the bushes and tried to kill us, or somebody jumped out with a gun or something, and we have a stress response, and that stress response puts us in a state where we can get away from that stress or um, neutralize it in some way, that's normal physiology. If you looked at someone's stress response or cortisol during that time, you'd say, oh, this is abnormal. But during a stress response, that's normal. Yeah. And that's health, is the ability to adapt to that and go back to normal. However, if we keep stimulating that, just like if we keep drinking that high sugar you know, beverage and the blood sugar goes up, it wears out that healthy response. And in the stress response, we keep getting those stress responses and humans are the only species that can think their way into a stress response. You know, they can uh, see something stressful happening completely across the other side of the world and fear is going to happen to them, put themselves in a stress response. You know, we seem to be the only people or the only species that can do that. And so if we do that over and over again, we can get this imbalance in the autonomic nervous system, imbalance in our stress response. And it becomes like we're stuck in this stress response, this low grade stress response. And the thing that measures that is heart rate variability. It's, it's the best measure of balance in our autonomic nervous system that I know of. And there's no mistake. There's no coincidence. I think that it's measured through the heart in some way, because the heart is extremely connected to our emotional state and our stress state. That's why we say things like, I love you with all my heart, or I gave it all my heart or things like that. Cause there's this emotional connection to it, but yeah. So heart rate variability is just the variation between heartbeats. And so I kind of like describing what heart rate variability measures through something else called respiratory sinus arrhythmia, because I think it's a better visual. So like if people took like their, their pulse on their wrist and they took a pretty deep breath in, they would feel their pulse quicken just slightly. And if you took a slow breath out, you would feel it get slower. And so the difference between the highest it gets when you breathe in and the slowest it gets when you breathe out is your respiratory sinus arrhythmia. And that's measuring your ability to adapt between different stress and non-stress states. So your ability to adapt to stress and the variation between heartbeats, heart rate variability is the same thing. 
And that's the more famous one that everybody talks about, but it's measuring that balance in the autonomic nervous system. Yeah. And also as part of that, Stephen, I guess we can also explore some of the the roles of the heart itself beyond simply acting as a, a pumping, you know, what are some of the major functions of the heart itself? Yeah, I don't actually believe that the heart is the pump. I don't think that that's the main role of the heart at all. I think we've misunderstood that. So, which goes to show, you know, the state of cardiology today and how they're having trouble with so many diseases because we've misunderstood what the heart is completely, I think. Not completely, but for the large part. So when you look at it, you know, the traditional understanding is that the heart is this pressure propulsion pump that's sucking fluid in from one area and forcefully pumping it out another way. And that's why it's contracting and things like that. Um, but I would say it's contracting, not pumping. So if we look at what's happening, and there are plenty of experiments that confirm this, is that the blood in the arteries and the veins is actually moving on its own as long as you apply energy to the system. So if you get infrared light to the system with the right electromagnetic fields like contact with the earth or other living things and things like that, it energizes water in the blood. And when that happens, it allows the water to structure itself on the lining of the artery. And that creates an energy gradient that propels blood flow. And they've done this experiment over and over again. They've shown that it happens in chicken embryos and dogs. And they've done these experiments where they put an artery like tube in water. They energize the water. The water starts to flow through the tube with no pump or any kind of force on it. It just happens due to these mechanisms of this structured water on the lining of the artery. And so the blood is moving more or less on its own and they've shown that experimentally. And so the only time the heart really does any pumping is just, just enough pumping to kind of get the blood through the chambers of the heart itself. But otherwise the heart is this device or this thing that's placed in the middle of already flowing blood. And so if you ask me or you ask an engineer what that sounds like, they'd say, oh, it sounds like a hydraulic ram pump heart ram, ram pump, right? Where water or fluid is moving into it. And based on how it deals with the pressure of that fluid moving into it, it kind of redirects it another way and pushes it out another way. So the heart is actually two kind of hydraulic rams, you know, put next to each other, the right atrium and right ventricle are one and the left atrium and left ventricle are the other. And so, you know, this is really important for is, is things like heart failure, because in heart failure, we're assuming the heart is not doing its job of pumping blood for whatever reason, whether it's a metabolic reason or a structural reason where the heart has grown to a bigger size. When in reality, if you look at what the heart actually is, which is this hydraulic ram that's flow activated, it's really the flow that's breaking down. It's the flow of the blood that's breaking down, not the heart pumping it. And so that's forcing the heart to actually do a little more pumping than it's supposed to. And that's why we get this dilation in the heart muscle, this dilated cardiomyopathy as they call it. And when that fluid in the body is not moving like it's supposed to, then it starts to pull up in areas like into the limbs, which is a characteristic of congestive heart failure. And we get fluid in the lungs, we get fluid in the feet, we get edema, swelling. And so the thing that really drives this whole theory home for me is when you look at the research on infrared sauna use in heart failure patients, and it's just phenomenal. It's amazing. Like when these people go into an infrared sauna, they energize the water in the body, gets it flowing, takes the pressure off the heart. Their ejection fractions go way up. The heart changes its shape back to normal again. The edema goes down. It's just crazy. So this is definitely a mechanism that's happening. This is, this theory is not a theory in my opinion. This is actually what's happening. So the natural question from there is, okay, if the heart's not a pump, then why is it there? What is it doing? Right. And so there's two reasons I think it's there. One is that when you look at the way the heart does contract around the blood as it moves through, it does so in a spiral-like nature. It kind of swirls it or vortexes it, so to speak. And that's one way that the water has been shown to gain energy is if it's swished around or spiraled or vortex in the presence of oxygen. And there's always oxygen present in the blood. So in that sense, it's a one way that the body kind of keeps the energy into the water and the blood. And then the second reason is that if I was to go for a run, my tissues would demand blood pretty heavily. And so if the heart wasn't there, all the blood would rush over to the arterial side and go to the tissues because that's where the, the delivery of nutrients and oxygen goes to. And it would all go to the arterial side and there would be none left in the venous side or very little left in the venous side and the venous side would collapse. The pressure would collapse and that would lead to death. And so when we put this thing, this heart in the middle of those two systems, it actually is very effective at slowing the flow of blood during exercise, during exertion. And that's why endurance athletes' hearts get bigger, not because they're more effective at pumping, but because they're more effective at stopping the flow of blood. And that's been shown in research I discuss in my book with soccer players 
But yeah, so it's there to slow the flow, but to maintain pressure in the system during exercise, which is very important or else we would die. So pretty interesting stuff um, that I, I kind of outlined in my book a little bit more detail, but yeah. It's very interesting. I just can't believe, I mean, I guess like one element there that you sort of mentioned was in relation to, I guess, something that I've always wanted to learn more about is left ventricular hypertrophy that occurs in mm. those who exercise intensely. I'd imagine there's specifics around the type of exercise, weight training being more of a, having more of a negative effect on that. Because a lot of my listeners are athletes or they train a lot. What might be some of the early symptoms of left ventricular hypertrophy and what does Western medicine do to actually treat that? Yeah. And I, I don't know. And, and I don't know that I would necessarily say it's a pathology. I mean, if it started giving you symptoms, then yeah, that's a pathology. And I don't know, some of the symptoms may be just fatigue because you know blood's not getting delivered like it's supposed to, or it's getting a little more backed up in the heart than it's supposed to. But I would just consider that an adaptation to exercise right? To use of the heart a lot, you know, it's always contracting over and over again, more rapidly in those people because they're, they're doing that, but that's just an adaptation. Cardiomyopathy, like dilated cardiomyopathy where the heart actually expands, like the heart muscle doesn't grow, but the heart gets stretched out and becomes more like a ball rather than like a football, like an American football, it becomes more like a basketball. And so that's more pathologic because to me that happens when there's too much pressure in the heart because the blood's not flowing through on its own like it's supposed to. And therefore the heart's having to more forcefully contract to move it along. And that leads to the stylation. And that would definitely be fatigue, would definitely be swelling in the limbs, those types of things, maybe shortness of breath, things like that, because the blood's just not moving like it should be. So, yeah, I mean, I think there are other issues with long-term endurance exercise that I talk about in my book. I'm not sure that, you know, people say that's cardiovascular training or whatever. And I don't like that it's called that because I don't think it's the best thing for the heart, the cardio, the chronic cardio, nothing wrong with cardio, but the chronic long-term cardio, I, I do have a bit of an issue with for various reasons, but we can talk about that if you want to, but. Well, what I'm actually really curious to know more about is circulation. That aspect of circulation, particularly in the health space is all about, it's all about nitric oxide. It's all about endothelial relaxation, like areas related to improving circulation through nitrate rich foods or citrulline, you know, things like that. Mm. Let's talk about nitric oxide. What sort of role does it play in the body? And is it protective in a sense for cardiovascular health? I wouldn't say it's protective necessarily. I would say that if you have high nitric oxide or good levels of nitric oxide, you have, that's an indicator of good cardiovascular health. That's an indicator that your endothelial cells are producing nitric oxide and there's nitric oxide can also be used as an antioxidant. So if there's high amounts of things that free radicals that cause oxidative stress, that can deplete the nitric oxide. So having high or adequate amounts of nitric oxide means that the endothelial cells are healthy and producing nitric oxide. And also means that the nitric oxide is not being used up too much by oxidation, by free radicals and things like that. So you could do SDMA or NMDA and things like that to measure nitric oxide. You could just measure the the health of the endothelial cells themselves, like myeloperoxidase or LPP, LA2, like those different markers you could look at to measure the health of that. But that's the cool thing about, so this whole idea I talked about, about how the fourth phase water, the water structure itself on the line of the artery and that creates blood flow. Well, that layer of water that structures itself on the line of the artery also acts as a protective barrier because another name for that water is it's exclusion zone water. Because when it forms, it basically excludes things that aren't it. So the only things that are allowed through are small hydrated ions of minerals. One of those being the precursors to nitric oxide. So that's why nitric oxide can get from the endothelial cells into the bloodstream because it can get through those, that fourth phase water barrier. But yeah, so when we think about, you know, foods and things like, like that, that have been shown to increase nitric oxide is because they help, you know, heal the lining of the artery best food I know, or best nutrient I know for that is taurine, which is high in animal foods, especially pork, but in all animal foods, it's really good for that. But surprisingly doing things that cultivate the energizing of the water in the body and the blood so that it can form that protective layer on the line of the arteries. And that's exactly what the research shows in infrared sauna use is that nitric oxide production skyrockets, endothelial function skyrockets, because we're creating this barrier that protects it. Now, one thing I don't know is that if we have atherosclerosis, can fourth phase water form on the lining of that? Because fourth phase water 
structured water forms on hydrophilic surfaces, water loving surfaces. And I don't know that a clot or atherosclerotic tissue, it would do that. And I asked people in Dr. Gerald Pollock's lab that, and they said, we don't know yet. That's on the list of things we want to look at, but we don't know yet. So that's something I don't know, which to me, I think that it wouldn't form as well, which is why we see when people have lots of atherosclerosis, they also are more prone to develop heart failure because the blood can't move on its own as much, which is putting more pressure on the heart, which is then leading to heart failure. So that's my kind of theory about that. But yeah, so, so taurine, but, but that's a, I love this example because it's not, it's like, yes, there's nutrients that can help with that. You know, people talk about like beets and, and yeah. greens and things like that. But I think things like taurine and also collagen protein, which is going to increase antioxidant production are super good for that. But then we also have to focus not, not just on the biochemistry, right? But on the physics of it, which is the infrared light, putting your body in the right environment, you know, grounding and infrared light, sunlight, things like that. Those are the things that help protect the lining of the artery, which is going to increase the production of nitric oxide through healthy endothelial cells. Yeah, I'm so glad you sort of mentioned taurine because a lot of my listeners know that I'm a huge fan of taurine. And I think one of my uh, my YouTube videos, I think it's number one ranked taurine video on YouTube because I just absolutely love that amino acid. And speaking of infrared sauna, I've got one to the left of me over here that I've you know, <laughs> used twice a week as well. But um, you mentioned water and I'd love to learn more about your hydration intake and the importance mm-hmm. of hydration in, in relation to cardiovascular health. I'd imagine a large percentage of the population is chronically dehydrated. So let's talk about the importance of water and specifically what types of water, because there's hydrogen water, alkaline water, filtered reverse osmosis, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So one thing as far as hydration goes, is like we talk about the system that the blood's moving on its own to the cardiovascular system. When we talk about what the heart is, is the hydraulic ram two hydraulic rams put together. And I want to emphasize the word hydraulic because then the hydraulic system, we have to have enough fluid in there to create the pressure, to create the movement, right? And so being dehydrated is not good because there's not enough fluid in the system that maintains how this works, right? Now, that doesn't mean just drink much water because there's certain waters that are better than others, right? And so it's about water that's very hydrating, right? So if we talk about the water that goes in and out of cells and things like that, it's all has minerals dissolved. It has things dissolved in it. And so, you know, there was this kind of trend to drink really pure water. And that's great. We do want to get the toxins out of our water because tap water and even lots of bottled waters are very toxic. However, we also want to leave the minerals in or at least add the minerals back because that's the thing that allows for hydration of the cells is when hydrated minerals are allowed to go in and out of the cells. They're carrying the water in on the minerals, right? And that's the way we find water naturally when it comes out of springs, out of the earth. It's highly mineralized, not very toxic. And so I would say, be careful with reverse osmosis water and things like that. I mean, I have a filter that's reverse osmosis, but I only use that water to cook where minerals are going to be added back into it or I add minerals to it if I'm not going to drink that. Otherwise, I drink spring water, either water that I harvest myself or buy. It's an important point about water. It's not just getting that water and drinking it. Is it not toxic? Is it full of minerals? Those are very important aspects to it. And people even, they talk about, oh, we want to energize our water. You know, just like I talk about with infrared light and things like that. And and you can buy devices that will help energize the water before you drink it. And that's perfectly okay to do. I don't feel like it's the most important investment in health unless you just happen to have money you can throw around because there's already a ton of water in your body. And if you expose your body to the right things, it's going to energize that water. So why worry about spending a bunch of money to energize the water before you put it in when you can just already have water there and just energize that yourself. So infrared sauna, sunlight, grounding, that kind of stuff. Makes sense. What about as far as, Stephen, I'd like to ask you like one final question in the cardiovascular health space, and that is in relation to, curious to know like what you see the future, like how do you foresee the future of cardiovascular research and what are you most excited to see more research on? Yeah. Oh, I can tell you where I'd like it to go, but I don't know that it's going to go that direction. So yeah, a lot of people don't know this, but I, I almost quit chiropractic and went back to get a PhD and I applied and I got in and I was going to go study cardiometabolic science, 
and I was talking to, you know, the co-chair of the program and I was just talking about what I wanted to do. And he was just like, Oh, you're going to have a hard time getting funding for that and blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, Oh, and then I kind of figured that it'd be really fun if my job was to just ask questions and try and go answer them. But I realized that the questions I could answer were going to be very limited based on how I could get funding. And so I guess if someone asked me the direction I want research to go, it would be one away from the heavily funding and it'd be more independent funded. And that's one direction. But the other direction is away from pharmaceutical based engineering, you know, of these biochemical pathways. So I used to work at a clinic more or less across the street from the Virginia Tech Medical School and Research Institute. And I had a lot of patients who were either professors there or students there. And anytime I got a PhD student in there or professor, I'd say, what are you working on? And they'd say things like, oh, I'm working on this one very specific biochemical pathway to see if I can change this one thing so that the pharmaceutical company that's funding me can make a medication for it. And I was just like, okay, that's interesting. I mean, and we found out a lot of interesting things about biochemistry based on pharmaceutical research. That's true. However, that's a really reductionist way of thinking. And it tries to isolate one certain, you know, biochemical pathway in the body when there's this complex biological ecosystem that is the human body that we're never going to fully understand. So rather than stepping back and having some humility for this thing that is way too complex for us to understand and learning about what environment creates a better outcome, we're trying to say, okay, we know better than nature and let's take this, this one mechanism and change it so that we can force the body to do something else. And to me, that's really egotistical to think that, and it's never going to give us a good result. Just like pharmaceutical medicine is clearly not getting us a good result because we're getting sicker and sicker and sicker with that approach. So I guess when I say like, how should research change? There needs to be more philosophy in medical research and in medicine in general, and less, I don't want to say less science because science is really important, but less reductionist science, I should say. That would be something that I would want to see. Yeah. Yeah. No, I really, really respect that statement. And I mean, I can also relate to that as well. I mean, I'm I'm a fully qualified naturopath, but my dad's a pharmacist. So I've always Mm -hmm. felt like I've fallen into that trap before by being super reductionist, just focusing on one little receptor site or one little enzyme and thinking that's going to move the needle the most. But I think, like you said, having more of a holistic approach and uh, a global view of that, it's going to lead to better health outcomes. And actually, I'd be curious to know, is there one particular heart medication that you think is absolutely like, well, we don't have to bash it completely, but maybe like you think it may be flawed. Like you think it's, it's doing one thing, but it's leading to a really poor outcome in some area, some other area of health. I don't know. Not necessarily flawed. I mean, I think they know the mechanism, but I'll say statin drugs just because they're the most widely prescribed. And I think that it's not necessarily the statin drug is flawed because that definitely does what they want it to do. It lowers cholesterol by inhibiting the production of cholesterol in the liver. However, when the whole idea that cholesterol causes heart disease is not true, if the theory's off, then treating the cholesterol, it makes no sense. And it's just making things worse because there are lots of side effects to statin drugs. And they all have to do with limiting the body's availability of cholesterol which is a very, very important molecule that your body uses for a lot of different things. So I won't say that the drug is flawed, but I'll say that the theory behind the drug is flawed. And that, since people are talking about putting statin in the drinking water, that kind of stuff is really scary because of the mechanisms and the the side effects and things like that. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, Stephen, it was a pleasure having you on the show. I mean, I learned so much and I know my listeners will have learned so much as well. And you're an absolute wealth of knowledge and I'll be continuing to support your work and If people want to connect with you, they want to learn more about your work, your books, where can they find that? My website is resourceyourhealth.com and my books are on there and my blog is on there. And I do like a little online health coaching so people can look into that on there. My books are on Amazon and Barnes & Noble and at the publisher's website, which is Chelsea Green. And then I'm on social media as well, just Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. It's DR Stephen Hussey, Stephen with a PH. And people can reach out to me there or follow me, see what I'm doing. Perfect. I'll make sure to leave those linked in the show notes. But um, yeah, Stephen, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Awesome. 
Thank you everyone for joining in to today's episode. For in-depth show notes and lessons learned, visit nofilter.media forward slash boost your biology. This has been a No Filter Media production. Say what you want.